Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet, still wrapped in a pandemic that emerged as a viral novel, a novel virus jumping the biological tracks just around a year ago, probably, probably in November, as far as scientists are being able to track back. Uh, and it has disrupted everything we thought we knew was normal. And it's not the only thing going on in this world right now. Um, that's consequential. Uh, we have an information epidemic as well, the infodemic around the pandemic and around other issues that are polarizing uh, America and confusing many people around the world. I see that almost as, as, as consequential. Uh, we have some wonderful guests here today to talk about leadership. You know, in the United States, we're at this juncture uh, between one administration and another, despite the first one is insisting it's not over. Uh, and so leadership is all in the news. There, I'll show you some headlines in a minute on where do we go from here? What does that look like? And what does it look like in a world like the world we have now that's so interlaced, has so many layers of complex, uh, I, I describe it as a tripwires and landmines that are all somehow interconnected. And how do you step forward uh, without um, blowing something up? And how do you keep track of that complexity and still have clarity? Uh, you'll hear more from my guests in a second, but I'm gonna start out I did this the other day and I think it's worth doing because these, these days are so consequential. These weeks just get at us. I'm gonna start out with some music from one of our shows um, on Sundays that we do. Um, and Dean Friedman had stopped by, who's best known for his 1970s radio hits, Ariel and McDonald's Girl. And he's in Peekskill, New York, not far from where I live. And he had written a tune for these times called uh, Halfway Normal World. So here we're gonna start, everyone take a breath. This is, this is a, 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 a kind of a hopeful song. I just want to go to the movies, meet up with a bunch of my friends, buy a box of Skittles, find some good seats in the middle, and watch till the credits roll to the end. And maybe stop at the diner, burger with some fries and a coke some pie for dessert couldn't hurt the service so slow it's a joke got some change in the jukebox the beach boys california girls i wish i could get back to a halfway normal world Take me out to the ball game Doesn't seem like too much to ask The diamond oasis Players are running the bases The catcher is wearing a mask We'll all root for the home team We'll fill up on peanuts and beer We'll yell at the umpire And tell him to retire And think of folks that couldn't be here on the mound, the pitcher of Southpaw, his curveball will be hurled. I wish I could get back to a halfway normal world. I wish we could get back to a halfway normal world. I'm gonna throw a big party. Invite everybody I know We'll kibitz and mingle I'll serve pretzels and Pringles We'll sit side by side and toe to toe We'll lose ourselves in deep conversation We'll play lots of silly games We'll laugh and we'll smile And then after a while We'll barely remember our names We'll all wind up in the kitchen at the counter with the tablecloth unfurled. I wish I could get back to a halfway normal world. I wish we could get back to a halfway normal world. <laughs> 
Yeah. Sorry, but that felt okay. Ah. Uh, <laughs> 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 written in that tree. Man, oh man. Oh, I think up. I'm ready. So, yeah, Dean, Dean Friedman, is, uh, he's written a couple of songs that have a darker tone related to where we're at. Um, but that, when he sang it, you know, we were all like, oh, geez, wow. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of pull there, and everyone wants to get back. Um, one thing I think we need to talk about is um, that notion of building back. You, you know, that's even Biden's campaign, uh, or you now his transition is built around building back better. But if we're building back, we're building back to the brittleness and issues that we are yeah. going to talk about, as opposed to building forward. So let's just dive in here a little bit. Um, again, it's great to have with me today these wonderful guests, Deborah Brosnan, who is in Antigua uh, right now and is a marine scientist in training, uh, but got into the world of disaster risk management and resilience and risk through uh, life experiences, including being um, a scientist on Montserrat in the Caribbean when the volcano erupted, <laughs> created a terrible tumult. Uh, that gets your attention and 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 sadly was on a 747 in Singapore that crashed on takeoff uh, and a number of people died and Deborah did not. So talk about gaining an understanding of um, risk resilience um, that that had have had a very powerful uh, shaping uh, influence on you on you. And yes. we have Mark Mickleby, Colonel Mark Mickleby, retired U.S. Marines. Uh, when my, uh, I have a nephew-in-law who is a Marine and served in Afghanistan and Iraq, and he's now pursuing a PhD in, uh, at MIT and Yale in economics. And it's a great to have that background. You you had a very active background too. I mean, you were not just sort of a a um, back office kind of Marine. Uh, Mark, but then uh, like a decade or so ago, you and um, a Navy captain wrote this really important report for these uh, the Joint Chiefs, laying out a new strategy for thinking about national security in an interlaced complex world like the one we have now. You were on this show way back. You were on like episode two or three in mid-March. Uh, it's great to have you back and we'll talk about what you're doing now. And my colleague, uh, Ed Hoffman here at Columbia University, who is a uh, has a background in how knowledge and decisions are made that grew out of 33 years at NASA, where he, among other things, was the inaugural chief knowledge officer. Of course, NASA, you know, you think about these epic projects, going to the moon, building a space station collaboratively with a bunch of countries, running space shuttles, which each, each one of which was a tremendous uh, complex set of risks and, and an opportunity. And, um, and Ed's, not, uh, wisdom is in understanding that landscape of knowledge, indecision, decision, conflict at the level of a team or at the level of a nation, or how does that translate to global intelligence? So it's great to have you all here. And Good to I be hope, here. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for having us. Hope you're doing well. Um, Deborah, uh, you're, you're, you're at the biological background. I mean, what we're looking at these days is a biologically induced phenomenon mm -hmm. that has spread through through our technological and transportation global as global systems again in a heartbeat uh, just just yeah. last on wednesday i was talking about one of the toughest data points was when i heard in april for the first time that um, the yanomami indians in the amazon in brazil in the middle of nowhere were starting to die and be affected by this virus that emerged as i said just a year ago uh, roughly in, in China, made its way through the system so far and so fast that it got into the Amazon. So what are the lessons when you think of leadership um, or where do we go from here at this particularly, you know, at what really feels like a juncture? Yeah. What, come, what comes to mind from your standpoint? So I think two things just from what you've said, Andy. The first is as, you know, as a, as a biologist, as a ecosystems scientist, um, all systems change and there's a rapid evolution that happens through life. Now we're used to thinking about ecosystems or life evolving at a fairly slow pace. You know, the dinosaurs were 66 million years ago or so. But when you start to look at it, the pace of change in the world is really faster. Like we're seeing corals already, um, you know, start to evolve against rising temperatures. And 
as somebody who's worked both uh, you know, personally, but also as a scientist on these hazards and disasters and ecosystems, I think I came into this the way that, I, that we all do as people, that an event happens and that the system deals with that event, whether it's an ecosystem or whether it's us, and that we will start then to recover and go back. But that never happens. And I remember both after the, you mentioned the 747 plane crash, thinking that at some point my life would go back to normal. But it didn't, I, I learned from that experience, I took that experience and it fundamentally changed me and changed what I did. The same with biological ecosystems, after they have a disturbance, whether it's a major hurricane or a wildfire, the forest doesn't grow back after a wildfire exactly as it did, nor do marine ecosystems recover exactly as they did. So when I think of leadership based on, on the fact that innately we're, we're adapted to change, I think for leaders going forward, we have to think not about building back, but rather where are we now? What's our starting point? And how are we going to build forward? What kind of a world do we want to see? How does our economies work? How are we going to manage climate change? How are we going to manage future pandemic risks? Because they are there. And I think for leadership now, it's about looking forward, but we have something that, you know, all organisms don't have. We can move forward with purpose. We actually have the choice to shape what the system is going to look like going forward. And for me, leadership now is about stepping back analyzing where we are, thinking how to move forward and doing so with purpose and doing so as a community, bringing people in. You know, good businesses work by good collaborations, bringing collaborations in. So that, that's what it means for me. That's, that's a really good summary. I, and now I see, speaking of bringing people in, I've got Don Mc, Donald McNeil. And Don, <laughs> greetings. I'm sorry. I, I Oh, come on. <laughs> I no, I set my alarm on my phone to be here, but I set it for twelve fifty a.m. Apparently, I just realized oh, I, that, I and so I just when I got your email saying, "Wonder if you're missing the link." I'm ah, sorry. Um, hey, no, no, this is all great. Um, and you know, I was saying the other day, we've all gotten so used to like instant meeting time because mm -hmm. we're all Zoom locked in under the same atomic clock. So I'm like, screw that. <laughs> it's, it's okay if people come in a little bit. It, it's, it, uh, this is not the first time I've gotten AM and PM mixed up, even though I have a window <laughs> over there that ought to keep it straighter. So just so those who, who don't know, uh, Don, Donald uh, came on at a short notice. I've been hoping to get you on this broadcast for months, but uh, I don't know anyone who's been covering the pandemic harder, more intensively than you. And I know a lot of people have been covering it hard and intense. Uh, Lori Garrett and, and Zainab Tufeki and so many others, Ed, Ed Young, but Donald, your your roots in uh, covering from, from, you know, Central Africa, all around the world, the emergent viruses and and other pathogens and pestilence and what they can do to, to society is just congratulations on uh, a really amazing achievement. This is a very hard work. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It, it's been the most rewarding year of my life, but I also feel incredibly guilty that, you know, 275,000 dead Americans is good for my career. So, Well, my, you were engaging like my 22 year old son who he doesn't read the New York times, but he was listening to the daily and he said, dad, dad you got to hear this guy. This was March, <laughs> March 25th. I think it was my birthday. It was like March 25th. And you were on there intoning very dramatically about what's coming. I, I am suddenly a character to the under 30 generation. It's very funny. I hear more about, it's like my daughters finally realize I work for the New York Times, you know, because nobody reads bylines, but the, right. um, but they do listen to the daily. Yeah, and this piece you just did, I think, um, again, you know, the data are so clear cut here. We, are, we know already where we're headed. Uh, mm -hmm. given this country's particularly our variegated response, our inability to have sort of common ground um, in response to these, the data is something we're still grappling with. And, and that's where I want to get, throw this to um, Mark Mickleby and then to, to Ed. Um, this is this thing, what does leadership look like now? A, a couple of months ago in here, I had David Bray from the Atlantic Council was talking about this is a really important moment for the world because 
let's say China's approach to stanching this virus is really cl clearly effective, right? And countries like South Korea get so much credit for how they've done it as well. But when you look at South Korea carefully, you realize it's a country that's already always on a war footing because that, you know, doom is like right there. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the countries that have responded aggressively, unless they're I like, you know, New Zealand, there, there's plenty of countries that get it right, but they have some particular circumstances that don't feel like America. So and our, and what, what David Bray was saying is he's worried that the world is gonna slide toward the idea that open societies can't do this. Like we need a model for an open society that can do this. And that's what I'd love to get from you maybe initially some thoughts on that. Mark, um, again, just for the, Donald just came in and may not have heard, uh, Mark was uh, one of two authors of a report for the Joint Chiefs of Staff a little over a decade ago, uh, painting out a picture of a new grand narrative, a new approach to um, um, sort of, from the security standpoint, how do you build a country that's quote unquote strong and it starts in, with an inner strength. It says you flip the, the narrative from containment to sustainment, I think, is that right? Yeah, well, containment to sustainability, sure. Yeah. 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 I feel like, you know, for a lot of folks thinking about the gun and I think, wow, but the chiefs of staff just got got a pretty interesting manifesto. We're, we're, so so how, how has that been doing uh, in that realm? And then, you know, just thinking about what I asked about the role of a nation on a planet like we're in now, uh, what comes to mind? Well, uh, you know, where does it stand now? Well, a lot of the oxygen was taken out of the room over the past four years. So we'll see where, <laughs> we'll see where yeah, it's that, from, right. from here on out. But it, um, I, uh, I also want to react to what we were talking about before and talk, I guess, try to do with the question you just asked me. But, uh, you know, in terms of leadership, um, you know, the big challenge right now, at least I see from the leadership, is that, you know, do we have the guts to like, put out a vision of what it, does it look like if we get it right? Because right now we spend so much time about looking in the rear view mirror about what we got wrong. And, you know, beyond just, you know, building back to try to go back to where we were. I mean, that's nowhere. You can't drive your car looking through the rear view mirror. Uh, so you got to be looking out forward. But, I mean, just having that, put that swagger back in our step that we can actually, uh, to, you know, paraphrase Abraham Lincoln, you know, we think anew and act anew. In order to do that, you got to design anew with completely different principles uh, than what, we, what we're what we used to. The economy of the past is of the past. You can't reinvigorate uh, that economy. We have to uh, go forward in new ways. In terms of, and you, you bring up, Andy, you brought up uh, security. Well, you can't have security without prosperity. You can't have security without, you know, uh, you can't have prosperity without security. We have to start thinking in different terms on how those two interplay. Um, but to, back to your point about can an, uh, an open system, a democratic government. Can we have that? So I say we have we have the system. We just have to we just have to use the strengths of that system and not let the uh, you know the the, the tenuous and maybe mm -hmm. more fragile uh, stitches in our fabric uh, be our primary focus. We have what it takes to move forward in the twenty first century and you know in terms of being resilient is be able to uh, build back better to steal uh, uh, President-elect Biden's uh, uh, phrase there. Um, but in my mind, what really the interesting, let's put China aside because that's a different system. But when you look yeah. at South Korea, when you look at Taiwan, you see you know, uh, Hong Kong even and Singapore and their responses to the coronavirus, the key nature was a willingness of a cit citizens to pony up and do their part. That is what's most distressing to me right, right. now is that we don't have in this country citizens willing to pony up and do their part uh and I'm, i guess i'm going to look in the rear view mirror for a second in world war ii it was it wasn't an issue of whether you're going to contribute or not everyone was contributing whether they were wearing a uniform or they're on the home front and uh to me that is the key aspect of, uh, or the key thing that we have to uh, rediscover and this is something that I touched on when we were working for uh when i was working for admiral mullen is that Re, uh, uh, rediscovering what does it mean to be a citizen? Because in the, you know, the preamble of the Constitution is not only the promise of America, it's our obligation to it. All the elements that go into the preamble of our Constitution. 
Uh, those are, that's our obligation as citizens. You know, and there's six words in that preamble that I think are really fascinating. And uh, Hubert Humphrey reminds us that they're, they're action words that, you know, we are, you know, we, the people, by the way, it says we, the people doesn't say waiting on Washington it says we, the people of the United States, uh, in order to form a more perfect union, establish us to ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and most importantly, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Those are six action words that we as citizens need to act upon. And right now, given this pandemic, uh, I, I, all those words need to be embraced by our citizens. And uh, that is the thing that leadership, only leadership can invigorate right now. And we've been really uh, uh, um, lacking in that capa uh, leadership capacity at a national level to be able to coalesce. And it's a, it may be cliche, but it doesn't make it any less true. So uh, what is the magic, uh, what's the uh, magic formula for people to recognize that they're just not residents of the United States, that they're actually citizens of the United States? I don't know, maybe we have to bring back Schoolhouse Rock or something, I don't know. But I mean, we need to have something uh, to, to bring Americans, uh, not just together, because that's not what it, we're talking about. We don't have to agree on everything, but we do have to agree on those principles in the preamble of the Constitution and that we need to uh, pony up, put blood and sweat equity in when required, and this is when it's required right now. And so uh, I know that maybe sound a little bit of platitudinous, uh, but to me, that's the essential element is what does it mean to be a citizen and recognize our, our obligation to that Constitution to the Constitution and not cherry pick from it to our own self interest, but how do we contribute? This is a time for contribution, not for taking. So, yeah, you know, a lot of what you had and and what you said in your grand narrative with uh with uh, Navy Captain Porter had that focus on citizen citizenry. That it, and I think I remember you said also when you're a Marine, you get an order, but you also get a purpose. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, that's, uh, you know, we, you know, people think if you're in the Marine Corps, somebody just tells you what to do, and then you just go off and do it. Well, that's not how the Marine Corps operates. Uh, we, uh, you get a mission, there's two parts to a mission, there's a task and a purpose. So the task tells you what to do, but the purpose tells you why you're doing it. And uh, we in the you know, Marine Corps, Army, you know, the modern, you know, professional military, uh, right now, we focus on the purpose, because we know that whatever task we were given, uh, you know, once you uh, actually hit the, uh, you know, engage the enemy or, you know, get in the uh, environment that you're in, you recognize that the task is probably no longer relevant because things have changed. Uh, just as Deborah was saying, you know, the, you know, complex adaptive systems are just that. They're complex, number one, and number two, they adapt on you. So you've got to be able to uh, adapt to it as well. So it's about the purpose. Uh, that's what informs your actions. So, you know, having the trust uh, uh, from in, in the Marine Corps, we call them trust tactics, that the commander will give you that mission, but he trusts you enough or she trusts you enough that you're going to go execute along the lines of the purpose that was given to you and not worry so much about, did you do the task? It's, did you achieve the purpose? And uh, I'll go back to the preamble of constitution. That's our purpose statement for this nation. I think it's enduring. I don't think it has to change. I think it is a, a, a masterful thing and that's what we should be focusing on. But, and I, 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 Plan. I want to swing to Don uh, to get some of your perspective, having dealt with crises and leadership or the lack of I'm it in so many different contexts. I'm different afraid country. I have almost the opposite view. Let's hear um, it. That I fear, after 20 years of covering this stuff, that democracy and individual freedoms are the enemies of public health, and we are now we. we we are lucky in that we are an extremely prosperous country. And because we are so prosperous, we are bringing forward the vaccines and the monoclonal antibodies and the other treatments for this disease faster than any other country in the world. But for the initial year where non-pharmaceutical interventions like quarantines, like lockdowns, like things like that are the only weapons we have, we fail to impose those in this epidemic, and we have failed to impose those in every epidemic I can think of that this country has tried to fight. Notably, well, we bungled the 1918 epidemic. If you go read the history of the resistance of every right. every city west of uh, you know west of Philadelphia and New York, 
to the anti mask league. Yeah, the anti mask league of yeah. San Francisco and and Denver saying, "All right, that's it. We've had uh, thirty five days now of lockdown. We're done with it. Let's go and and go do our Christmas shopping." It, it, it was a messed up. Episode. But even more important, I've written about a lot of places that have dealt with AIDS somewhat successfully. Um, and it makes me extremely unpopular because I basically end up with a conclusion that places like Cuba that quarantine people that locked them up in the early, early days of the epidemic had the most success. It was not an anti-gay action. It was mostly an anti-soldiers who had come back from Africa who were infected with the virus of both sexes, mostly heterosexual, but as soon as as soon as Castro could get a hold of tests for the virus, he tested people and then he put them away, not in prison camps, in essentially bungalow colonies. And the main thing that they were prevented from doing was going back and having sex with their wives or girlfriends or anybody else. And mm. you know, people are horrified by this. And I've had an extremely angry note from Greg Gonsalves, who was a epidemiologist from Yale that I respect a lot, and an AIDS activist. And he said, you know, how would you like it if? You know, people like Jeff Schmaltz of the New York Times have been frog marched out the door off to a quarantine camp. And my response was, look, I was actually a friend of Jeff Schmaltz's. We knew each other even before Jeff came out. And Jeff is an example of somebody who would be alive today if there had been a stronger effort to squash the epidemic in this country in the early days. Because if you look at the number of people in New York City who have died of AIDS and the number of people in Cuba who have died of AIDS, that New York City and Cuba have roughly the same population, around 12 million people. New York City has had about 75,000 deaths from AIDS. Cuba has had about 2,500, maybe closing on 3,000 now. Now, yeah. somebody has to speak for the 70,000 who died as a result of the failure of the country to say, you have to behave. I mean, there were gigantic civil rights fights over the closing the bathhouses and closing gay bars and stuff. And I recognize that those civil rights fights had to be had, but in fact, many, many, many people died because you can't get people to voluntarily engage in good behavior, which is using condoms, telling the truth about you're infected during the last 30 seconds before you get lucky. Um, sure. And, uh, you know, um, and, and just changing your sexual behavior. And, and yeah. people don't change their sexual behavior. People don't, a lot of people won't change their tuberculosis related behavior. And people certainly are not even changing well, here was pretty simple behavior. I mean, the things you need to do in order to avoid getting infected are relatively easy. You can lead much of your previous life. You're only willing to eat outdoors if you're willing to wear a mask, if you're do doing to, able to take some um, restrictions on your behavior that are not all that onerous, and yet people resist them because they're individual rights. So, you know, um, yeah. other examples of places that have, that have worked through, you know, the, the porn industry kept HIV and all other, this is the straight <laughs> porn industry, kept HIV and all other diseases at bay, sexually transmitted disease, by compelling everyone to be tested every two weeks and <laughs> creating a system in which producers could check to make sure that every actor had been tested negative in the last two weeks before they allowed them onto the set. That's so me, compulsory. It's compulsory in a business point of view rather than a personal freedoms point of view, but it works. You so, lies. yeah, there's a lot there. And, and at, at the scale of the international scale, there's definitely this question of, um, as you just articulated, part of what we're talking about in America is the open society model or the fact that the, the, that liberal is the, the true libertarian or capital L liber, liberal attitude that resisting top down signals. Now, Ed. You know, you've dealt with the corporate yeah. sphere and you've looked at culture, the sort of the culture of risk and risk management and innovation. What, you know, what, what comes to mind from you, uh, your standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, so I, I identified somewhat with Don when you said, uh, you know, your career is taking off as a result of a uh, crisis. Uh, my career really started as a result of the Columbia Space Shuttle uh, disaster going back to 1986 when NASA says, okay, we need to get clear in terms of how are we developing the capability to run our missions. And uh, so that was my, uh, my, my point for the last you know, 30 years of what, what accounts for that. And uh, basically I think really uh, it comes down to the ability of how do we develop the capability for people individually, in teams, in organizations and in societies to think 
And, and I think we tend to go past that because I think most people think, okay, you know, I'm smart, I'm knowledgeable, I, I know what it is, and then we make decisions. Uh, but what I saw about uh, the teams uh, that I worked with at NASA was that you always had smart people. You had scientists, engineers, economists. You had people who were smart. The successful teams were able to talk. They were able to argue. They were encouraged to innovate. Uh, they were comfortable to disagree. And when they saw something stupid, they were comfortable to say, that's going to create a problem. And the projects and the teams that uh, failed or had big problems Typically, what was happening is that they did not use their total thought capability. In other words, they didn't use all the the talent that they had. And in some cases, they were told, "Don't talk to, don't talk to Washington. They're gonna don't talk to the industry folks. Don't talk to DOD." You know, there's this sense, unfortunately, uh, uh, that we instill uh, that as you become smart, it means you don't have to talk to others. And the best teams know that that's totally wrong. They create an environment, they create a culture of sharing, of arguing, of walking, of seeking help, and of not worrying about what happens if I ask them in. So um, th th that's always what I saw. But, but that's very, very hard to do because it, it rubs up against our individual egos. It runs up against the notion of, you know, when I was young, I was always uh, heard, uh, don't bring me a problem. Bring me a solution. Right. But then you ask people, why didn't you raise that problem? Well, it's because I'm not. So, <laughs> so I think a lot of it has to do with the capability to think. And in the society, um, we get information from all different places. We can get it from machines and we believe things that we like and we ignore things we don't. Um, but I think it's uh, at the individual, the team at the societal level is having those conversations and uh, being put in a, you know, creating a culture where that's the norm. And, and we were open to learning things and changing our minds. So uh, on that score, I want to get to Deborah in a second, but I thought I'd like to flip things a little forward looking in the sense that when I think about the Trump four years on top of the pandemic and everything else, it's kind of like we talk about compound risk, you know, when you have a hurricane, mm -hmm and a wildfire and a pandemic at the same time, whatever. Uh -huh. um, this is a political extreme storm that we've been in. Uh, I think there's some aspects of it are going to play forward for sure because of Republican opposition seemingly to get having Democrats do anything when they're in power. But given what you were just saying, Ed, and Don's wise thinking about like all of us reporters saying, show me the evidence we can do better. Um, what feels like it could create a better dynamic going forward? Like, like setting aside the extreme storm we're in now, like and setting aside even the pandemic, saying in a general environment where you're gonna have extreme weather. And as I said earlier, the infodemic, we're, we're in an ongoing infodemic in a system that we don't understand very well yet, social media and everything. What, what does a Biden or um, the EU leadership or, you know, what, what works better than what's yeah, happened? Let so me just, just quickly react and then I'll yeah. these people are more experienced and, and, and uh, have a lot of things. Uh, you know, I studied way back at uh, Columbia uh, with Morton Deutsch, uh, who is uh, really obviously uh, known in terms of conflict resolution. And uh, one of the things we talked about the other day was his crude theory of social relations. And I always come back to that. If you treat me with respect, if my opinions can be heard, if we can disagree, then what people do is they do those things and they come up with better solutions. If on the other hand, I'm working for a leader or for a, for a team where the notion is you, you know, stay silent until you're spoken to, then you get those behaviors. So whether it's a Biden or any kind of leader of a, of a team or a mission, they create the uh, social relation dynamics for how everyone else is going to mimic that to to the benefit or to the detriment of how we treat each other. So and, and Deborah, um, from your arena, you 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 give advice to governments, to companies, to mm -hmm. other entities related to resilience. And 
everything I know about resilience and responsiveness and preparedness has to do exactly with this. Open listening, mm -hmm. you, you know, cross-sectoral analysis, and then getting to Mark's point, uh, mission and and task and, and so perfect. what? Yeah, and so what comes to mind again? The building forward better. <laughs> if we build our information decision system forward better, what would that look like from your standpoint? Yes, yeah, so I think um, so. As a scientist and and with several colleagues, uh, political scientists, social scientists. We've really been talking about from through the lens of science and through the lens of scientists, because as you can, you know, it's pretty obvious that there's been a growing distrust of science, a distrust of experts, um, a polarization and a cherry picking of science. And I, this whole question of going forward, how do we rebuild back the public trust in science? And we've been thinking about this quite a lot. And you know, how, how do we, how do we re-engage science and the value that the knowledge of science brings and the tremendous resources that have been spent on getting this knowledge? How do we bring it into the community where the community is ready to listen and where it, where it actually can have the value that it, that it does? And, and I think what, I, what I'm coming back to, and I think this is true for whether it's government or whether it's our communities or whether it's the corporate sector, which is this whole idea of what we call social learning which is to start engaging scientists as citizens, to, to use Mark's phrase, with members of the community or whether it's members of the corporation or members of government. And what that means is it's not simply about giving advice. It's simply, it's being in the room with the other leaders from different sectors or from different, whether it's different departments in the, the industry and being able to talk as Ed said, being able to talk and have people around the table listen. And it's an exchange of knowledge where people listening have their own values, their own viewpoints, and that comes up. And so basically the process is that everybody comes to the table with something and that something is presented and listened to, and then there's a debate. And it's everybody at the table learns, everybody at the table contributes. I think for science um, and for the knowledge, you know, these knowledge areas in general. I've often been in rooms where people have said, well, you know, we're going to be making business decisions or policy decisions. So all we want is if the scientists would tell us the knowledge and go away because we, we, you know, scientists don't make decisions, they give information. And that does a huge disservice to science and it does a huge disservice to the people in the room. So going forward, we need to create this new, um, this new framework, this new fabric of getting scientists into the room getting other members, other stakeholders into the room, not keeping them out because they're, they don't belong in the finance discussion or the policy discussion. And I think if we start to do that, that we have two, uh, several tremendous opportunities. One, coming back to Mark's point, we can start to build this concept of citizen, citizenry, scientists as citizens, policymakers as citizens, because we are all citizens. We are all tackling the same issue and we don't have to agree. So we can take away some of these ideological divides because we know we have them going in. And for me, going forward, I think if we can start to do that at all levels. So for the Biden administration, if he was to call me tomorrow and say, what should I do? That would be the first thing. I say, get the talent in the room, but put it in a framework where everybody's learning and everybody's free to speak. That's the first. And similarly, whether you're a CEO or whether you're the mayor of a town, this is the time to start pulling all the resources we have and getting everybody talking in this framework. Yeah, that, that's such a valuable perspective. And it, it came up on a recent webcast when Neil Lane had been and head of the NSF, the National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm. He and uh, Roger Pilkey Jr. did a commentary for Nature saying the first thing mm -hmm. is to get the science advisor at the cabinet level and it's exactly what you talked about. It was about developing the fluidity, the relationships. It's not like coming in and briefing the cabinet. It's the relationships so that when data is needed, it's there and that, like the like. Yeah. Um, can I? Can I? Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Don, on, and I, Don, I was going to, by the way, I was going to turn to you because like in the New York Times newsroom, how many times did the science desk get ignored <laughs> in these oh. big complex stories? 
uh, no, I, I, there was always a sort of cult of science. Like the, the, mm -hmm. if these people tell the truth and, they're, and, and they're, we drag them in uh, to, to explain the stuff. We, it's true, you sort of kick them out of the room once you want a decision made about news judgment, but we were always seen as the people who actually understood the things that were complicated. No, I was just gonna interject to say, um, there's actually some good news on this front out today, which is that a, a Pew survey came out of about 12,000 Americans, mm -hmm. which um, was mostly directed, it was partially directed at um, you know, vaccine acceptance, and it would show that things are shifting very quickly, that more than 50%, 60% of Americans now say that they're eager to get a vaccine, and only about 20% of Americans say that almost nothing will convince them to get a vaccine, which is down from 50%, 50% you know, a few months ago. But more interesting to me it, in that was the fact that belief in science and, and um, the credibility of scientists has actually gone up to higher levels than it was at before the pandemic. I never expected that, but it seems like people have gotten a good lesson from, you know, the value of science. Yeah. Um, it, it's not the question of letting people speak in the room. It's, you know, beat them with the rod. Something bad happens that science can solve. Mm -hmm. They will come around right. and say, hey, let's listen to science reporters and let's actually listen to scientists. I hope anyway. Well, yeah. I mean, Ed, you, you grew up, well, most of us, let's see, yeah, we're most, of, most of us are old enough to, we grew up mostly in the 20th century, right? We grew up with the space race, with science being in the foreground with that can-do spirit. Um, and I, I had bemoaned that that felt like it's been lost. Um, so maybe maybe that's a good sign. I well, Andy, say, I, if right? I can just respond uh, there a little yeah. bit, because I do, to me, like when this started, there was very much the, you know, there was Dr. Fauci and then he was listened to and then he was, you know, vilified at various points. But the thing that I'm seeing, and it, it kind of comes back to this, the few, um, that you said just came out is that uh, I have more people than ever now asking me about science, asking questions, asking questions about vaccine, asking questions about the virus, asking questions about climate change. So I do think that one of the silver linings in this is that suddenly people have gotten re-engaged with science, suddenly it matters. And they're starting to, to become more knowledgeable and the more knowledgeable they become, the more they find it really interesting and fascinating. So I'm seeing, you know, I don't mean among my colleagues, I mean among my non-scientist friends, and even people in the store, you know, who, who if they find you a scientist, start to ask a question and engage you. The number of people who are doing that has gone way up in, in, in my experience, and I, I think that's fantastic. Some silver lining. That, that's good. Um, let's hope that, that that's sustained. It, there's still these big divisions of, over when it comes down to what you do or don't do in certain contexts. Sure. I also think, you know, the important, I, 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 if, if there was one thing that I'd say that I, I learned from NASA and beyond was uh, what you're discussing, uh, Deborah, is the, the importance of a conversational society. Uh, yeah. when, when I'm asking 30 seconds or less, tell me about uh, how do you know if a team is being successful? Teams that are successful are noisy. They argue, they talk, they walk around, they laugh, they meet each other. Projects that I work with that are in dire straits are very quiet because uh, people don't want to mm -hmm. talk about things. So I, I think it really gets to that larger, yeah, scientists need to be out there. They need to be politicians. Uh, you know, there's a great book that explains a lot of the stuff, Strangers in Their Own Land, uh, where you're talking to people around the country who feel totally disconnected. And when people don't feel heard, uh, then that's a prescription for big, big problems. Mm -hmm. so, that, that feels like a big I, part of where we've been at. Yeah, just to add, I mean, a key component. I mean, I completely agree with what everyone's been saying, but the, I, I, at least in my mind, you know, uh, you have to come to the table with a whole bunch of humility, you know, big bag full of it. And that's not the, it's not a thing about being self-deprecating. It's just like, right, you know, humility is such a key, especially if you're a leader, that you don't have all the answers. Um, so you, you, you want to have, uh, as Ed is talking about, that kind of loud room. I mean, the best units I was ever in, they, they were pretty loud. You know, uh, the quiet ones, like you, you said, they were pretty miserable, morale is low, and uh, just didn't, didn't function well. Uh, but the, you know the the side of humility in terms of having these conversations. I mean, humility allows you to table your ideology. You know, as John Ralston Saul mm -hmm. called it, the, the false faith of ideology, because that's really something that's been hurting us uh, 
you know, beyond the political sphere, now it's gotten into the socioeconomic sphere and now into the public health sphere who, or the public uh, health sphere. I mean, who, who would ever thought that, you know, but, um, but I think it's just, it's an issue of humility that allows us to learn, that allows us to have those conversations and allows us to progress forward in no uh, other, uh, I guess, sector realm then you see that our, our scientists, scientists have to come to the table humble. Otherwise, they can't uh, perform as scientists. Um, well, yeah, there's more beyond just the technical aspect of scientists that we can learn from. Just by how they carry them, carry themselves professionally, is uh, something we can all learn from. Uh, with Ed, with Ed Hoffman earlier this week, we had a session on leadership, a Columbia a webinar, and um, one of the challenges is getting the disciplines of science to talk to each other. They all have different paradigms, different. They don't even, they don't understand uncertainties the same way they don't and then getting them to talk to engineers is a whole nother thing so it's like that and that comes only through sustained uh, connectivity as well and by the way here we are in a world that feels so disconnected unless we're on a screen that creates another one of those gaps i think that open society that i love that what ed just said about a loud what you both said about a loud society is here we are isolated more than ever from each other uh, and yelling at each other with memes on Twitter as opposed to um, connecting in those ways that can cross some of these barriers. I, I wanted to pull out to the global scale again. Uh, there there was this, uh, just this week, um, uh, Peter Beinart had an op-ed in the Times um, challenging this notion that also comes in crises like this. America has to resume leadership. We have to get in the world and be number one. And he's saying, no, 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 we're in an interconnected world. And that's not what we should do going forward. And he lays out a kind of a logic for that. And it brought me back again to what Mark Mickleby and, and Ed Porter said in their session. I just want to play a tiny quick session here, a section from, this is way back at Pop Tech in like 2011. So uh, uh, humor me for one second while I set this up. Um, oh, I have to take it out. I have to do that. I have to do that. This is so funny. Do that, and then this, and then this. Complicated being my own producer. So here, just listen for a second. Competition isn't a zero-sum game. So Not in a deeply interdependent world. So how do you regain that when you're 33rd uh, uh, among nations in science education? Oh, I missed the hold on. The best possible athletes. And oh, by the way, it's not only is it a win-win, win, but because it's a cultural event, people come around and look, it's a win-win-win. That's how we got to view competition. It's, competition isn't a zero-sum game. So not in a deeply interdependent world. So competition isn't a, a zero-sum game in a deeply interdependent world. I think that that gets to this, it does, I think that fits with what Beinert said in his column. So what does America do in that on that scale? Mark, do you have any thoughts after a decade of making that point? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I'd like to think, uh, learn more and re uh, rethink that concept, but I, uh, I'm still, I guess, stuck where I was is that, um, you know, you know, again, the competition side of it, I mean, that the insight comes from just sometimes if I don't know what else to do, I do an etymological drill on some, but co competition comes from competare. Competare means to strive together. You know, it does. So interesting. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's interesting where the original concepts come from. And in terms of, I do agree, we don't have to go out there and tell everyone else how to do things. Let, you know, that's not our role. Our role is to be the best America uh, we can be. I mean, this goes back to, this is George Kennan 101 kind of stuff. Uh, and just be the best America uh, and uh, have faith in our system and who we are as a people and our, our culture. And you know what, the, be uh, you know, the, the best way to lead is just by you know, leading by example. I mean, it's tried and true. Uh, and uh, I think that's all we have to do. Right now, uh, we are not being the best America. We're not making the right kind of investments. We're not engaging our population as citizens uh, anymore. And uh, I think uh, you know one of the concepts we threw out there coming out of Admiral Mullen's office was that you know our smart growth uh, at home will be our smart power abroad. You know, and we don't have to worry about doing things, play Stratego the way we did in the 20th century because Stratego is not the game of the 21st century. It's just not. And uh, we should just, uh, and this isn't America first. It's just, you know, have faith in our system. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where if you just be uh, the best you can be, you're going to find people lining up behind you to follow you. If you're trying to tell everyone, you know, where they got to go and where they're going to do, you're going to turn around, you're going to find nobody's behind you. Uh, it's just got, you just got to walk the talk. It's that simple. And I mean, we can get into what, what that means. So it's not, you know, again, just a big platitude, but I mean, it's, it's not that hard of the challenges that we have to face. We just have to, from climate change, this pandemic to food and uh, scarcity, our housing uh, uh, shortage I uh, issues. I mean, these are all things, if we take, uh, take charge of them and start figuring out the systems and the uh, economics around it and how the capital flows ought to go, uh, the rest of the world's going to follow and just are. So Don, uh I want to circle back to you before we conclude on a hopeful note. <laughs> you know, you've again, you've gone from uh, epidemic zone to epidemic zone. You, you've looked at dysfunctional parts of Africa and other parts of the world. You've been in dysfunctional America right now. And and um, would like uh, what are some of the concrete things? Obviously, the WHO relationship is something pretty crucial right now. Uh, I don't know what, what else comes to mind. Um, what, what, what's been bad about what's happened so far? And is there anything, well, I, you know, we've generated a bunch of vaccines in a very short period of time. So that feels like a good thing. Yeah, I, I don't see, I mean, I don't see this notion of America leadership or not to be a choice between Trump's idea of America number one, but totally isolationist versus, you know, America just as kind of another member of the United Nations. I don't see any reason why we can't engage with other countries all over the world and yet be the leading partner as we are in the NATO alliance, as we have been in many other alliances, <clears throat> as we are the biggest supporter of the World Health Organization and, and stuff like that. For, for political battles and for economic ones, the difficulties are harder, but from, for, on my beat, it's a no-brainer to cooperate. I mean, the viruses that are threatening the world mostly don't break out of Kansas, although there was that question as to whether or not the 1918 flu started there. They mostly start in Southern China. They often start in Africa. They start in the, the crowded parts of the world and they s start in the parts of the world where people are chopping deeper and deeper into the jungle or whatever habitat that's gonna bring you into contact with, with animals whose viruses you don't normally get in your bloodstream. And that's gonna continue. And we have to continue to cooperate with the Chinese, the Vietnamese, the Laotians, the everybody else, uh, you know, and everybody all over Africa who's like, and we have to strengthen, I mean, we don't need to strengthen the Chinese at, at surveillance of, uh, of disease, although we actually have. I mean, the Chinese CDC is based on the American CDC. Enormous numbers of Chinese scientists have you know, come over, been educated here, worked at the CDC and gone back there. We should not have taken the attitude at the beginning of this epidemic that, you know, we'll drop, let us uh, let us in and we'll come over and give you some advice. It's more like the Chinese response was, hey, we don't need any of your advice. And we certainly don't need you coming in here and telling us we're doing it all wrong and, and to give us the samples and go back to Atlanta and you know, print them up in your own journals, which is the historical role of the CDC is to take over the work of foreign scientists, which produces a lot of bad feelings around the world. Instead, we have to come up with a sort of, you know, we're in a leading position. Um, Many other nations are also really good at the stuff. We ought to recognize how good French research has been in in uh, Ebola and Zika, for example, because I was always shocked when I started covering those diseases to discover how much work they had done that we had completely ignored because it wasn't printed by the CDC. We need to cooperate with the Chinese. We're now in an effort to get billions of doses of vaccine around the world, and we're leading in making vaccines that are not going to be able to be exported to the rest of the world because of how cold they have to be kept. So I think one way or another, we're going to have to cooperate maybe with the Russians with their freeze-dried version of the vaccine, maybe with some other later um, uh, developments in the vaccines that are, that are <clears throat> can be kept in regular refrigerators, and we ought to, we ought to help out. <laughs> If, if not to be good people, but simply for self-interest, because I can't fly anywhere out of this country, even if I'm vaccinated with any confidence, until everybody in that country is vaccinated too. So, you know, we don't want people from every country coming to uh, the United States, to New York next year for the United Nations General Assembly, if the people from those countries haven't been vaccinated against the disease. And we don't want to go anywhere from touring Paris to going off on an African safari unless the people in that country are vaccinated. So we have very strong, I mean, in the, in the health area, we have very, very strong imperatives to cooperate on all fronts, both in surveillance and, and in research and in, in vaccinology and in spreading out, you know, increasing the health of other people in other parts of the world. 
And we ought to stop spending as much money as we do on carrier groups and think about how many people have actually been killed by germs versus the people that we're opposing with the carrier groups and come up with better surveillance systems and better vaccine platforms and, and uh, you know, and, and better monoclonal antibodies and, and uh, you know, better small molecules in order, to, in order to fight these things. So I just posted up here, uh, Zainab Tufeki had a really powerful story that just post uh, was published uh, last yeah, few days. Yeah, she's great. She's great. On There's China, a dispute about her inside the Times, but I think she's terrific. I do too. And I think she nailed this one where she talked about these Chinese scientists who were really the heroes who enabled this rapid vaccine push. Um, and to me, this gets at one of the other, the transparency, if we can foster transparency as much as possible and efficient transfers of data between and among countries, whether it's extra governmental or not, whether it's through the media sometimes or not, that can propel things forward in a way that's better yeah. than opacity. Uh, it's a it was shame very disturbing. That... It, was the, it was the guy who gave the okay for the sequence of the virus to be posted, who was immediately punished and his lab was shut down. And he did it almost by accident by, you know, by saying to his Australian collaborator, go ahead, post it. And then he got on a plane to Beijing. And by the time the plane landed, he was in trouble. So uh, access to information really makes things uh, click better. I think, uh, I, I think we're in, we're well positioned generally to have a world that's got more of that than less of it. Um, Oh, the fact he, that you can design a vaccine by simply having somebody send you the sequence of the virus again, that it's against, it's an amazing, amazing right. uh, advance that we've got now. So we just have a few minutes left here. Uh, if you, any of you have a hard stop at the turn of the hour, let me know, but uh, we can go a few minutes long. But I wanted to be sure we have some final thoughts from each of you uh, before we head off toward the, the rest of the day and the weekend, whatever that is. <laughs> um, maybe, Ed, you know, lessons from NASA and more generally, this dynamic you have with yep. students you get, who can get now a master's degree in essentially knowledge dynamics. Uh, what is that an, an emergent field, or is, is this is this something that's well, been is now? So I mean, partly goes back to I think what Deborah just said at the beginning. Things are changing so fast. There's so much turbulence, whether it's healthcare, whether it's uh, you know issues in terms of uh, you, you know uh, security is how do you keep up with what's happening? So you need to have that ability to learn. Uh, I, I would, I guess, summarize uh, briefly is there's ways that societies, teams, and individuals become smart and capable. And what they do is they rely on machines, they rely on data, but ultimately they rely on other people. And if we use all the sources of collaboration, those teams and societies are successful. And if we do things that cut that off, then, uh, then, then we're increasing the likelihood of failure. And that leads to the other thing that I'd say is risk. What are the risks? If you ask any team or any society, what are the things you worry about? They will tell you what the problems are there. But we tend to overemphasize the technical and the economic risks. And the biggest risk is always the social and the political. How do we want to work together? And if people decide to work together, then they define the problems and they create the, the proper paths. If we don't even think about social risks, then, uh, then we're always into games of how much does it cost and what's the tool and it doesn't work. So I think the, the issue of judgment is really vital. And, and Deborah, a last thought? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think one, one of the thoughts we're kind of coming to together is this idea of transparency and almost leadership by collaboration as opposed to you know, Mark's point about competition, it's not a win-lose, there's win-wins. And we're seeing this in the scientific community, as, as Don was saying, this incredible sharing of information that never existed before. You did your work, you wrote it up, you published it, and then you shared. And now it's like, well, I've got science, I've got data, let's put it out there so that it's useful to somebody in, this, in the pandemic. Uh, it's, I think this has transformed science. I think it's transformed the way scientists are gonna work in the future. And it's transformed the way we're going to, like scientists will value each other, which is, is to me is great. But I want to leave you with one thought because I always, I, I learned most of my lessons from looking at ecosystems and nature and the evolution of natural systems. So we were, uh, when I was a student, we often learned about how species compete with each other and it was competitive, one, one, one lost. But when I started to look at how ecosystems fit together and, and we're seeing this more and more, the most stable, some of the most stable and the strongest and most persistent ecosystems are where species cooperate with each other and they provide benefit to each other. 
And it's that positive interaction web that allows these ecosystems to persist, whether it's mussels on a rocky shore providing a habitat for 350 other species that live in it, and those species then help to protect that mussel bed. It's um, this, com this uh, notion of kind of collaborative wins is actually throughout our natural world. So let's take it forward. That sounds good. And, and Mark, uh, you're, you're, you're the mission and the task. <laughs> The purpose, I mean, sorry. I'm sorry. What's the, what's our- uh, I'm sorry, you're talking about No, I was gonna say a last thought from you in terms of uh, looking forward. If, if Biden, um, uh, if you got onto a Zoom call with Biden for 30 seconds and, and there was some lesson you learned uh, in part of the grand strategy you guys uh, worked out, what would be the first words you would whisper to him? Uh, say, uh, well, I'm, going to steal from uh, uh, George Marshall's uh, wise words to uh, George Kennan when he sent him out to figure out the, uh, the whole Marshall plan in three weeks time. He said, avoid trivia. So uh, avoid trivia. Take a deep breath and, you know, just, uh, we know we've got to get done. So just try to get above, avoid trivia above part. the noise. Yeah, that's really important. Keeping your eyes on the big game. Uh, and the media too, you know, we, um, the New York Times has done incredible work, The Atlantic, others, uh, at keeping that big picture in mind. So it's not just sort of the story of the day. This is the story of a century. It really is. And not just the story of a virus. It's the story of a species, us, trying to figure out how to use our knowledge and our connectedness, which is global because of the miracles of the internet, uh, to the best purposes we can and not, not have it be exploited and, and divide us and create paralysis when we need cohesion. So. It's been great to have you all here today. Um, Don McNeil, my old friend from the New York Times newsroom. Thank you. And Ed Hoffman, my new friend from Columbia, where I've been for about a year. And uh, hopefully, hopefully I'll be here a lot longer building an initiative on communication and sustainability, which is all about how do you make information matter? We had a great session today. And also to uh, Mark from coming back again for the second time to talk about resilience and, and leadership and and my friend, Deborah, who's also been on at least one other time. Thank you again for being here. Um, I was just gonna show you where we're going from here. On, uh, on Sunday, we have our regular music session. On Monday, when I focus on communication skills and innovation, we're doing a session on propaganda with uh, Renee Hobbs at U University of Rhode Island, who's literally written the book on propaganda. She has an open source um, tutorial in the new book, Mind Over Media, Propaganda Education for a Digital Age, which should be um, invaluable <laughs> seeing as we're fused and surrounded by it. And on Wednesday, we get to this question of the roots of pandemics. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in the tropics uh, decades past, and this is on how the rights for forest guardians for indigenous peoples particularly can help uh, can limit all that um, degradation and invasion that's happening in tropical ecosystems that contributes to uh, viral spread and evolution. So lots more coming. Thanks again to all of you. This is uh, a global online conversation, Sustain What? Identifying solutions to the complicated shape-shifting and epic challenges of humanity's great acceleration. That was the last half century of our Zoom on this planet going from 2 billion of us to toward 9 billion. What do we do next? A prime focus is making sense of and getting the most out of the planet's fast forward information environment, the one connecting us right now. It's the system, it's the earth system that's changing faster than the actual environment. It's how we share and shape information. It's produced as part of my work building Columbia University's new Earth Institute initiative on communication and sustainability. As soon as we're done, share the link you've been watching on with friends and circles far and wide and check out that little scrolling bar at the bottom for ways to get in touch with me about episodes going forward or any feedback you have for the show we had today. And again, thanks to my friends for being here. And uh, thank stay you. safe. Thank you very much. Connect thank from you. a distance. And Don, thank Donald, you. I would thanks, love Andy. to have you back. Uh, there's lots more to talk about when you have time. Thanks for all the hard work you've been doing. Thank, thank you, you all. Bye. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah.